Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon, and I'm an associate professor of political science and director of the European Study Center here at Pittsburgh. Today's conversation is focused on May 68 and the legacies of protest in France. Um, and this is part of our Global Legacies of 68 series um, that we are having here at the um, at, at Pitt this semester. So thank you all for joining us. Um, the conversation is sponsored by the European Study Center and is supported by the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. Our co-sponsors who are joining us remotely are Florida, International's Uni Florida International University Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Jean Monnet Center um, of Excellence as well. Thank you to everyone who helped in putting this together today. Um, and just to put onto your calendars, our next conversation on Europe is on elections in Italy, a new wave of populism, which will be on March 27th. Uh, and this conversation will be in Italian. So for all of those of you who speak Italian, this will be a good chance to practice. All right, so to, to start, um, I'm, I'm putting up some, some uh, posters um, from the 68 movements, which I'll talk about um, as I introduce uh, what we're doing today. So you can um, have a look at those, whether you're here in the room or remotely. Um, May 68 is synonymous with the unrest that unfolded in Paris and beyond between students, trade unions, at the police and the government over four long weeks in May of 1968. One of the hallmarks of these events were the posters that the students and the trade unionists created conveying their concerns, their beliefs, and hopes for change. Um, and I'm going to show you a few of, of these right now. So that what you're looking at now is the verb to participate conjugated from the student's perspective um, all the way through to they at the end, which says they will profit. And so that sort of sets up um, a bit what the students were thinking in terms of who they they, they were. Um, next slide. Um, this is another image from, from 68, uh, which gives you a, a perspective from both the students and what they thought of the government. So what, what this says is be young and be quiet. Um, and you have sort of the silhouette of, of Charles de Gaulle in the background there, who was the president and who was the focus of much of the, uh, the student and uh, trade union unrest, and obviously putting a hand over that of, 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 a, of a young person or a student. Um, the next slide here is, uh, again, to kind of put things into perspective, this is a uh, member of the CRS, which was the French National Police, with the Nazi SS uh, on his uh, shield. Again, what the students often equated with the French government in the 1960s was equating the government with that of the uh, with the Nazis, and that is something that is obviously up for discussion and debate. Um, uh, can turn to the next slide, um, and this perhaps is what encapsulates much of that month of unrest that we're going to be talking about in terms of its legacy. This says the beauty is in the streets, and here we see uh, an image of a of a of a of a student throwing a brick and having upended sort of the, the grates that often were around the trees in, in Paris and in, and in other cities. And this very much is um, what the movement was about, that the, we were going to see change not in parliament, not through elections, but in, in the streets themselves. Um, the events, however, culminated in parliamentary elections later that summer, in which the Gaullists, the Gauls party, won an even bigger majority than they had previously held. And that followed by the resignation of President de Gaulle the following year and his replacement by another Gaullist leader. And so the actual sort of results are questionable in terms of what happened in the immediate um, weeks, months, and even years after. And that is something that we will discuss today in terms of what the, the, the legacy 50 years on is. And so we see some of these, a couple of posters that kind of convey that message. So here you see um, this says a return to normal, right? And this is an image of, of the, the French perhaps as sheep or often they were referred to as calves, sort of coming, you know, getting in line, doing what they were supposed to do, kind of walking in sync um, and responding to uh, things in, in that way that we weren't going to see any revolutionary change. Um, and then from the trade union's perspective, this says the beginning of a long struggle. Right with the red flag of the, the communist trade union, and that we really didn't see the changes that we had hoped for. So even though we may not have seen sort of the changes immediately that the students and the trade unionists and others had hoped for, um, and it may have seemed that nothing had changed, things had changed, and nothing would actually ever be the same again when we talk about politics, policy, culture, and society in France and perhaps across Europe, and even around the world more generally. 
Um, and today uh, we've gathered then a panel of experts to discuss these legacies, these long-term legacies of these notorious events on protests, participation, left and right wing movements and parties, culture, human rights, imperialism, worker and immigrant rights, et cetera. We could obviously spend many hours talking about all of these things, um, but we will try to do our best in the next in the next hour or so with with the following uh, experts who are joining us today. Um, so to my right is Josephina Macchia, who is associate professor. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Excuse me, Macchia is associate professor in the Department of French and Italian at Pitt. Her research focuses on literature as a material labor in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries in Italy and France and the French and Italian modern and postmodern aesthetics. She's worked on authors and texts that allow for theoretical and political discussions. Dr. Mechia has published three co-edited volumes, including The Idea of France, a special issue of Cites, the Journal of French and Francophone Contemporary Studies, six book-length translations, and several articles and over 20 chapters in edited volumes. She's also currently teaching our course on, on May 68 um, at Pitt, and we have several of her students joining us today. Welcome. Joining us remotely uh, first is Chris Reynolds, uh, who is Associate Professor of Contemporary French and European Studies at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Dr. Reynolds' main research interests focus on the events of 68 from both a French and European perspective. He has published two monographs, Memories of May 68, France's Convenient Consensus with the University of Wales Press, and Sule Pave, The Troubles, France, Northern Ireland, and the European Collective Memory of 1968, published by Peter Lang, as well as several articles and chapters and edited volumes on the events and effects of 68 in France and across Europe. Dr. Reynolds is currently leading a significant project with the Ulster Museum on the question of Northern Ireland, 68. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. Uh, next, we thank you. Next, to next we have Salar Mohan. Uh, Desi, is, who is the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at Bogan College. Dr. Mohan Desi's research interests include imperialism and anti-imperialism, the global 1960s and 70s, 20th century social movements, the history of the left, and social and political theory. His current project, tentatively titled From Anti-Imperialism to Human Rights, traces the history of transnational anti-Vietnam war activism in France and the United States, to explain how and why human rights displaced anti-imperialism as the dominant form of internationalism in the 1970s. His research has appeared in Les Temps Modernes. He has a forthcoming article in French Historical Studies, and he writes for more popular venues. He's also the founding editor of Viewpoint Magazine. Welcome, Solar. Thank you. Finally, we have uh, Daniel Gordon, who is senior lecturer in European history at Edge Hill University in the UK. His research focuses on the international movements of 1968, intertwined histories of migration, racism, and anti-racism in France from the 1930s to the present day, relationships between the state and protest movements in France, and transnational relations between social movements. Dr. Gordon has published a monograph titled Immigrants and Intellectuals, May 68 and the Rise of Anti-Racism in France with Merlin Press, and over 20 articles and contributions to edited volumes. Much of this work is focused on memories of 68 in contemporary French politics, on conservative responses to 68, and on relations between French and British anti-racist movements, including, for, including a forthcoming article in Labor History Review on the secret negotiations between Jacques Chirac and the French-Polish communist trade union leader Henri uh, Krasuki, which played a, a part in ending the French general strike in 68. So welcome to you and to everyone um, to, to this panel. So we have lots to cover in the next, in the next hour or so. So I thought uh, we would start uh, by giving everyone an opportunity to um, answer the following question, which is, what does 68 mean to the French? And relatedly, as you're thinking about this, how does this meaning differ for different groups? Those who were alive at the time, immigrants, those on the left, those on the right, et cetera. Who would like to start with this? Chris, I will let, okay. let you start on this. Uh, okay, so thanks very much for inviting me to this um, conference, this discussion. Um, so in response to this first question, um, well, I suppose the answer is, well, it depends who you're talking to. Um, so um, you've rightly identified, for example, differences between people on the left and the right. Um, but I would add into that also 
differences between old people and young people. Um, importantly, differences from a geographical perspective. So, if you're speaking to people who um, are are from or were from Paris and compare their understandings or perspectives of 1968 to those people who lived or live in the regions, you will find that there are great differences there also, mainly because the experiences were very different as well. So I think there are a whole plethora of um, different perspectives and everybody has an opinion on 1968, yeah. that's one thing. If I had one pound for every time somebody said, Mais je là, um, then I would be a very yeah. good man indeed. Um, However, I do believe that despite the fact that there are these different um, narratives out there, I've always tried to argue in my work on 68 that, that there is an overarching dominant narrative, which I believe has been built up over the course of the last now 50 years, unbelievably, um, and that this dominant narrative is rather limited um, in its outlook. Um, and I can hear some of its influence in even the way that you describe um, the events of 1968 in France, so with a, a very specific focus on Paris, a specific focus on May, and a very specific focus on students. 68 May 68 was, was, was much, much more than that. And I think that one of the things that we will see in the forthcoming 50th anniversary is um, a serious challenge to what I've described as a convenient consensus on France's 1968. So I'll stop there and let somebody else talk. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, because I think you started saying something that I also wanted to say. And so I'm just going to sort of piggyback on your on your comments, uh, which my comment was that May was about two things. First of all, the date of May 1968. And second of all, the definitions of left and right. Um, so for, uh, because people, you know, when you say, oh, it depends if people were on the left or it depends uh, whether people were on the right, but left and right, you know, historically are not defined in the same way. I mean, it's a matter of specific positions on specific uh, issues. And, um, and the issue of what was left and right in 68, it's also related to the issue that 68 does not start in 68. Um, a very important component for France specifically, I would say that countries in Europe all have their own 68, you know, different temporal <laughs> frameworks. But for France specifically, uh, 1968 uh, comes on the heels of the anti-imperialist decolonization movement. And this cannot be understated. And the, the very definition of left and right in 1968, or the very issue of whether you were going to support some way, somehow, what was happening in 68, was, I would say, um, largely predicated on your stand on France's uh, colonial past and present, uh, and on the goal, I mean, the goal himself as president and the goal's position, very complex, and I leave it to the historians to give details about this issue of decolonization. Um, another very important fact, and so that had started in France. So in that sense, 1968, in its anti-imperialist, in its critique of capital as an inherently imperialist, uh, organization of society that had started at least uh, in the late 1950s. Um, I'll leave it there. So, and, and that is how you define left and right. And that is also how you define Gaulism, right? Gaulism was not born in 68. Gaulism was born arguably in the late 1940s and then again, during the Algerian war. Solar, jump in. Sure. Um, I'll say just a couple of things. Uh, going off that point, I, I agree completely. Uh, my research is very is on the Vietnam War and anti-imperialism. I think 68 does certainly begin before the month of May in 1968. I will also add that it's important to recognize that it ends not in June of 1968, but continues deep into the 1970s. And in fact, 
the 1970s, I think, is, is where the real action is. That's when you have a higher rate of strikes, you have more uh, and diverse groups speaking out. Uh, so I think when we think about 68 and what it means, we need to expand beyond just these two months in 1968, look a little bit earlier, and also look really deep into the 1970s, which is where you get a major social crisis. As for the meaning of uh, 1968, I, I agree completely with, uh, with what Chris said about um, it, it means very different things based on different groups uh, and groups not just left and right, but also age, I think is, is very important where you were. I will also add that um, what May means is also um, different within the same group. So even within the left, there are big differences over how you interpret May, what it stood for, whether it was a success or a failure. And I will say sometimes it's contradictory even within the same individuals. Uh, I know some people who look to May 68 as a decisive moment in which the very way that we understand politics changed, that politics had to mean uh, a radical change in all spheres of life. But there are also the same people will sometimes tell me things like, you know, there's just all this spectacular emphasis on May 68. I'm just sick of it. You know, I excuse my language, but there was a, uh, a graffiti in Greece in 2015 that said, fuck May 68, fight now. And this is a sentiment I get from some of my friends in France where they feel like there's just too much of an obsession on this spectacular event. Uh, and it obscures these other things that have happened. And partly there's resentment at the generation of 68 and what they have become. And some of their representatives entering into positions of power and becoming the very system that they were trying to change. Uh, this is also, I think, carried through in the meanings of 68. When you see some of the figures who are now in power running the government and involved in some imperialist wars that the generation of 68 was uh, originally opposed to. Daniel, would you like Great. Um, th thanks. I, I would agree with a lot, a lot of what has been said um, so far, um, but how, how 68 has been remembered is, is very diverse, um, depending on, on political orientation, um, depend, depending on geography, uh, and, and depending on age. Um, uh, but, but it's not only about age, because I think both in 1968 and today, um, there is sometimes a kind of overemphasis on the on generation as a as something which explains um, politi political political um, conflicts entirely. Um, when when we look at when we look at 1968 um, in a, in a more complex way, we we sometimes find that you know not not everybody aged 20 in 1968 was was a radical. So that there's also um, con conservative and an extreme right activism at the time. Um, and not every radical in 1968 was was, was age 20. Um, so uh, we have to understand the experience, say, of factory workers who had been on strike both during the Popular Front in 1936 and, and in 1968. We want to to, um, you know, to to understand 68 in a way that gets um, get, gets away from from the kind of cliches of of, of the kind of 20 year old student. Um, throwing paving stones at, at, at the police, so um, there is there is really quite quite a diversity to it. But often the way that it's remembered, as as uh, you know, as as Chris has said, um, has narrowed that down um, to uh, it's, it's essentially the, the student experience and essentially to, to the month of May. And and that's why I think um, you know we, we we get that kind of um, resentment that, that Salah was was rightly talking about. And you know you can see this as early as as 1986. Um, uh, pro protesters were, uh, you know, uh, when there's a kind of revival of student protest, um, protesters were already fed up with being compared to 68 and saying um, 68 is old and 86 is, is, is better. Um, so um, although 68 is sometimes a, uh, an inspiration for, for current protest movements, it, it, it can be a double-edged sword. Chris, did you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, so I mean, loads of really interesting points that that I can only really add to by saying, well, first of all, you know, the complexities of 1968 are are, are obvious, um, even in the notion of the difference between left and right. One must take into consideration the differences that existed at the time between forces on the left. Not everyone was a uh, gauchist, um, extreme left-wing student, and in fact, they only made up quite a small percentage of those people who were involved in the in the movement, and there were quite 
quite a lot of tension even within the left itself. I completely agree on the importance of um, the sort of anti-colonialism that existed in the early 1960s, late 50s, early 60s, and in particular the, the Algerian conflict, which had a huge impact on the politicization of the university milieu, um, which carried on then into the mid to late 1960s, and understanding the politicization of the, the French university system in 68 is predicated on taking into account what had happened during the, the, the battle against the Algerian conflict. So, I mean, that, that, that's very, very important. I, I concur with um, um, Daniel's point on um, the resentment, which is often levelled at 1968 being um, a, a symptom of the rather narrow um, representation of the events that, that, that um, would create resentment. You know, this idea that it was a bunch of spoiled bourgeois Parisian students who had a good time, then went on to be very successful, and we're paying for their pensions. Um, I understand why um, young people in France today, in a context which is much more difficult, would look back on that period in the way that it's depicted and feel some sense of resentment. But the reality is that, not as Daniel Reilly says, not everyone was a student. Not everyone was who was involved was a student. Not everyone who was involved was a young person. And we need to take into consideration the, 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 the magnitude of L'Enfleur, the magnitude of these events in order to understand why it is that we're still talking about it 50 years on. I also wanted to comment on uh, two really important points that have been made before. And I think, um, sp and, and really the term that uh, struck me, you know, in, uh, I think it was Salah, um, that used the term spectacular. Were you the one who said that there was a spectacular aspect to it? And if you focus only on May 68, there are iconic images that uh, were broadcasted internationally and that became 68. And, uh, you know, and that of course makes me think of, um, makes me think about, about all of the risks of, um, an event uh, as complex as the movements, I would say, that loosely occurred between 1966 and 1971-72, as then being fossilized on these images of May 68. That's a huge uh, risk. And uh, another, and so, and with that, I also want to say that the spectacular aspect of images and not only the broadcasting, but then the remembering, the historical memory of images becomes a problem today in the way specifically that um, these self-indulgent uh, survivors of 1968 uh, then portray themselves and what happened. And I have... Um, just as an example, although the guy is not French, arguably, although I think he, wish, he wishes he were. And this is the Italian director, Bernardo Bertolucci, who made a movie called The Dreamers. Uh, and uh, The Dreamers is really, uh, and I just want to say that he portrayed exact, exactly that spectacular moment, uh, nostalgia, self-indulgence, mm -hmm. Uh, the revolutionaries were these two kids, you know, uh, bourgeois family. Uh, the images of the revolt, quote unquote, are completely, uh, in a way, are completely cliche. And cliche, really, in the in the in the literal sense of the word, they're taken from an image, a memory of images, and they're recycled in cinematic images. And so I think that 50 years later, it is important to step away from that kind of spectacular and potentially self-indulgent septuagenarians remembering <laughs> incorrectly what it was. Mm -hmm. Solar, do you want to respond? Um, Sorry, I didn't know if you were jumping in. You don't have to, I just uh, Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I I, I agree with all that. Okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. I, Sorry. Technological. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Chris, I actually want to get back to something that you said, which I thought was really interesting, and, and get your reflections on this. So, um, you had made this comment, and and I heard this too, that everyone says "Jetela, I was there," <laughs> and so even if they weren't right, and sort of they were there in sort of 
literally or sort of metaphorically, but what is that? And Chris, if you'd like to respond or anyone else, what is that? I what is that idea that everyone has their own 68, everyone was there, even if they weren't necessarily physically there. What does that actually mean for sort of creating the, let's say the legacy of what this, of what 68 more generally, and obviously we'll get into sort of some more of that in a minute, but what, but what sort of effect does that have? Well, I think it can be explained by two different, in two different ways. I think, first of all, a lot of people did experience 1968, um, and it didn't happen just um, in Paris, and it wasn't just students, and it wasn't just workers either. Everybody was was affected by 1968 at the time, and as a result, um, the the consequences of it were widespread and enduring. Some of it slow, drip, drip over the years. Um, some of it was arguably is still going on today. So I think that everyone um, can, in some way reflect on how 1968 has had an impact on their lives one way or another. Um, I also think that, and I've, I've talked about this um, in some of my work, that I think that, that 68 is often, um, the, the image of 1968 is, is, is very positive within the French collective memory. I think it's something that they're generally quite proud of. Um, and it's actually quite cool to be part of 1968. To be able to say you were there in 1968, that you took part in it, is, is something that people are, are happy to do and want to do because of the, the generally positive nature and, and, and the way in which it's depicted from a French perspective, I must, I must add. Um, so I think that, and, and then there was a great example of this when Sarkozy um, had, a, had a dig at 1968 in 2007 when he said, Il fallait liquider l'esprit de 68. Um, you know, we needed to liquidate the spirit of 1968. The, the general consensus in response to that comment was no. There was great opposition, not everyone, of course, but there was a, a, almost a, a clamour to defend 1968. And I think that that then is linked to um, how 1968 is not, should be considered in isolation. 1968 is just one more episode in a long line of episodes right back to the French Revolution, that demonstrate that the street, La Rue, um, has and maintains a certain degree of importance as a, as a vector for people to express themselves and to bring about change. And I think the French are and are right to be proud of this tradition, and I wish there was some more of it today. Thank you. Um. Um, yes, I mean, talking about today, I, I have a couple of comments about that. Um, uh, so I have a couple of comments about that. First of all, that uh, the importance so that uh, people can say, well, 68 was a failure or 68 did not succeed in bringing about the changes that it promised. But 68 was uh, a moment where certain practices of extra parliamentary politics sort of got tested to the limit. And uh, it strikes me <laughs> that uh, the same practices are enacted every time that citizens of any Western country uh, don't feel represented anymore by their parliamentary institutions. In other words, it's, I totally agree with what Chris was saying, that um, the street is a place for politics. And I think that this is a lesson of 68 that the French have not forgotten, but that nobody really has forgotten. And I want to say that today, and I came making a point of wanting to say this, that today our high school students are walking out their schools uh, as far as they're allowed uh, in protest against the lack of response uh, on the part of the American government uh, to the uh, gravity of the gun uh, violence that they're experiencing. And what are they doing? A very, they're striking. I mean, in a way, they're walking out their schools. And if that is not a 68 tactics, I don't know what, what a 68 tactics is. Mm -hmm. So that's the point that you allowed me to make. And I was happy to make it today. Mm -hmm. oh, it's very, very very relevant. I wanted to step back and, and talk a little bit more about something that's come up uh, several of you have raised, which is the fact that, um, and, and rightly so, and I realized when I kind of gave the intro, it was very much the sort of um, standard view of 68, but again, that was a bit of just kind of the 
uh, the background to set the stage for, for the discussion. But as we all know, obviously, and as you all mentioned, that there were lot, many 1968s, whether the and 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 that 68 has become sort of uh, you know sort of a metaphor for so many things. Um, and so I want to talk a bit more specifically, and 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 Daniel, I, maybe you could jump in. Um, to talk a bit about sort of the different 68s, right? It wasn't just Paris, it wasn't just the students, it wasn't just the trade union, trade unionists. And, and, and to talk a bit perhaps more about the 68 for workers more generally, for migrants and some of your own work. Um, and then we can kind of follow up with what some of the others, uh, others think about this as well. Yes, so, so uh, absolutely, we need, we need to look at different groups and, and, and actually, um, High school students were 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 one of them. So um, th there was a big movement, um, the Comité d'action lycéen, the the um, action committee of of lycée students, um, um, and many uh, many many young people as, as as young as 15 years old were were very active indeed. So it, it wasn't only um, university students. Um, so um, and 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 that and, and again wasn't always only on one side. So when when uh, Nicola Sarkozy was uh, 13 years old, he 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 tried to uh, join in the counter demonstrations, but uh, apparently his his, his mum tried to <laughs> make it in the end. But um, but certainly but certainly there, there is that, that mobilisation amongst amongst teenagers. Um, but um, but but um, but but I think from the point of view of um, the the government the most worrying thing was um, the strikes in the factories which um, essentially um, brought brought production in France to to a standstill um, for for week, weeks at a time and uh, so so we you know we can't understand 1968 without understanding that it was the largest uh, strike the, the largest labor uprising in in French history and in particular, um, I've certainly emphasised that the, the working class that carried out that general strike was a multinational uh, working class. So there were there were three million immigrant workers um, who had moved to, to France um, in, in, in the period uh, immediately be before then. And um, <laughs> although uh, we might we might uh, imagine and certainly people people thought before 1968 that they might be um, fearful of, of going on strike because they they were very vulnerable to to deportation and to and to other uh, repression by by the government. Nevertheless, um, um, a surprisingly large number of immigrant workers did uh, did go on strike. Um, you know, were were on picket lines, uh, participated in in meetings inside inside occupied buildings. Often more more cautious about. Uh, about uh, demonstrating in, in, in the street because uh, because they, uh, as, as, as we know, that the French police had a has a, has a certain reputation and they would be the first to to be beaten and and, and uh, arrested. But um, but um, there is a kind of hidden history of Im immigrant worker participation in, in the general strike, which I think got rather forgotten afterwards because. Um, because May 68 has been kind of nationalised as a kind of quintessentially French uh, phenomenon, when um, in, in, in many ways it's you know it's it's simply the, the, the kind of French version of of a, of a of a broad international revolt that's, that's happening at the time, and you can see links between you know the movements in France and, and the movements in, in Tunisia, uh, the movements in, in Senegal at the time so it's it's uh you know it, it was very much uh, a movement that crossed national uh, national borders so Laura, do you want to join in and sure think about, um, um, yeah some of these other uh, yeah ideas of you know other other may 68s and for different groups and things like that yeah i i mean i'll say um well, there's a few things that could be said about it. First of all, I think that in many ways, May 68 kind of creates a window for other more marginalized groups to make their voices heard and raise their own specific demands. And when, they, when I say that, I want to be very specific that these groups were always there from the beginning. It's just that at the moment, they had been overlooked and passed over in favor of student leaders, almost always men. Um, but what happened was these marginalized groups really pushed the logic of 68 to its limits. If some of these student leaders are calling for expansion of politics into everyday life, changing different spheres of existence. You know, women started to ask, well, what about gender and the oppression of women? Uh, queer folk asked about uh, sexuality. Um, immigrants started asking about citizenship. Uh, prisoners 
uh, it, it developed their own prisoners' rights movement to look at this other space of politics. So you just have a real expansion of what counts as politics, who is able to raise their voice and make demands. Um, so I think that is, that's a really important dimension to it. I would also say that even um, those individuals whom we would not normally expect to be leading radical protests were also in some ways touched by 68. So uh, there is a group, for example, called the um, Group Information Santé, or GIS, that was largely led by doctors who decided to put their medical services to use uh, at the service of the people. And they got very interested in uh, fighting for abortion, healthcare, um, you know, workplace health conditions like poisoning. Uh, and they wanted to kind of dissolve this hierarchical role uh, and division between specialists with knowledge and practice. And so I would say that May 68 is even felt by some like professionals or people that we wouldn't think to be very radical, but they are kind of, they see 68 as a, a moment of possibly overturning fixed social roles and rethinking the way that they fit into larger capitalist societies. Um, I, there's more that could be said, but uh, I'll stop there. Just a comment about that. Um, I think it's very important to think about uh, the reflection about institutions that are not only uh, like the parliament or the presidency, but social institutions that sort of um, regulate daily lives in mm -hmm. Western societies. And to the group of doctors, I do want to add another group that was called Jerry, which is a group about um, uh, the institutional therapy, which is basically psychiatrists and mental health workers. Um, we have to remember that in 1968, uh, in France, we still had uh, Maison de Fou. I mean, we still had asylums uh, in Italy too, in Europe in general. And that uh, a reflection about mental health as a problem that cannot be reduced to um, the vagaries of individual chem brain chemistry or individual childhood tra trauma, but a recognition that mental health expresses itself differently in different kinds of societies, and that the kind of mental health that we have in Western societies is part and parcel of a certain <coughs> organization. That is also an important uh, part of the different groups, the different movements that 68 sort of, as you say, gave a voice to. They were there, but they had no common space to express themselves. So I just wanted to add this note about mental health, which is also a big problem today. And I think we should remember the lesson of 68. We have to interrogate our own institutions because people don't go mad in the same way at different times in history. That's another lesson of 68. Mm -hmm. So I think, is Chris Reynolds not? Yeah, can you hear me? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh you can want you hear me? I can't see you. I can't okay. see you guys, okay. but I'm not going to touch it in case anything happens, because other ways it will <laughs> okay. really break down. It's quite good that I can't see myself. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like that. He's up um, to the if I could just add to what I agree with everything sure. that's been said, um, the uh, one thing that I would say is that um, the kind of marginalisation of these um, forgotten elements of 1968, such as the um, the role, the very important role of immigrant workers in 1968, this marginalisation is part and parcel of the 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 way in which the memory of 1968 has been constructed um, over the years, um, because it's easier to talk about 1968 and not have to talk about the role of immigrant workers, because once you start to talk about the role of immigrant workers, then you need to open up a whole set of very difficult questions that um, that, that, that reveal or shine a light on some of the difficult circumstances, uh, more problematic circumstances. Um, of this period um, in France, and I would encourage anyone to read Daniel's fabulous book on um, this question um, as a as a great source um, to uncover this forgotten story of the role of immigrant workers in 1968. Thank you, Chris. It's true. <laughs> I also had a comment about the international dimension, like the other 68s, and how France is or is not part of these other 68s. Um, 
it is uh, maybe not widely known that one of the most important, certainly um, one of the most famous, I would say, <coughs> contemporary uh, French uh, women uh, directors, uh, Agnès Varda, uh, who uh, has won uh, recently an Oscar uh, or an Academy Award, yeah, an Oscar to the career. She was awarded the Oscar as her career as filmmakers. Um, I, I think it's an, it's an interesting curiosity, uh, and my students will laugh because I'm obsessed with this, uh, that she was in Los Angeles actually in 1968, and what did she do? She was filming the Black Panthers. She was filming the Black Panthers. She produced um, a very interesting, and uh, you know, not surprisingly, artistic documentary about uh, the political, social um, uh, activities and image uh, of the Black Panthers. Uh, just to, just to, just as a footnote, that the French themselves knew that they were part of a larger international movement, and that if they hadn't had that sort of confidence, like that sort of belief that they were part of a large international uprising, probably even May 68 in France would not have had that kind of scale mm -hmm. and range, just enough. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I want to um, kind of bring out a couple of things that, 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 that you all have, have mentioned, both the sort of international aspect of, of 68, which um, I think is uh, important to talk about um, in all sorts of different facets. Um, and, it's, and then also sort of the other 68s in Europe, right, um, as well. And I know, Chris, you're working not now on Northern Ireland, but we can talk about obviously 68s in Italy and in Germany, in addition to, you know, 68s for all of the different groups that some of the different groups that we've mentioned. Um, so if, if, if anyone wants to sort of jump in thinking about kind of the international perspective or the larger European perspective, um, both in terms of the meaning of 68, also sort of what happened, how that's part of the sort of collective memory as well, um, in, in terms of what we think about. Um, Solar, would you like to start with this? Sure. Um, I, I, the, the last point, uh, Giuseppina is your name? Uh, yes, yes I, I agree yes. entirely with this. The French, and this is the point that I wanted to make, but I, I didn't want to take up too much time, is that even many of the like young male student activists at the heart of these events, um, themselves thought of themselves as on the peripheries of a larger global movement. Um, the, the international connections are huge to other parts of Europe, obviously. Uh, they're reading texts from other countries, they're traveling, they have conferences together. This is really fundamental. There's solidarity demonstrations when Rudy Duchka is shot. I mean, this is a really big uh, international context. I would also say, again, the non-European context is uh, just as important, if not even more so. The United States is a huge reference point for black power, the anti-war movement, feminism, and the counterculture. And I would say perhaps the largest reference point is actually the global south. Uh, Cuba, China, uh, decolonization and anti-imperialist movements in Africa. Um, and I think one of the biggest reference points is Vietnam which uh, war has escalated in 1965. Um, if you look at many of these students and radicals who are involved, and if we're just focusing on this group, many of them cut their teeth on anti-war activism. This is where they first get very seriously involved. Some of them had already begun with the Algerian war, but it's with Vietnam that they are able to break from the Communist Party, develop independent organizations, really learn how to battle police, build networks with other activists. There are several international conferences, one in Liège in October 66, one in Brussels 67, a very famous one in February of 68, where you have thousands of radicals from 15 different European countries coming together to talk about how to uh, help the Vietnamese win the war. Uh, so the anti-war context is, is really, I think, the condition of possibility for May 68, uh, for at least for Many of the activists who triggered the events of May 68, they're very much thinking in terms of this international anti-imperialist movement. Daniel, would you like to 
Yes, yes, I, I, I would agree with that. And, and I would add that the influence was not only because the, the French activists uh, had been active, um, very active on these international issues, but also because international activists were, were present in France in May 68 as well. Um, and, and, and yes, that, that's both, both European and, and non-European. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I've, I've been through the, 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 the files um, from the French Interior Ministry of the foreigners who were deported for their involvement, whether, whether, whether real or, or, or alleged, in the, in the events of May 68. Uh, and it's striking that while um, you, you, do, you do find a significant number of, of immigrant workers from, from some of the, uh, the nationalities that made up the bulk of migrant workers in France, from, from, from Algeria, from Spain and from Portugal, but you also find quite a lot of Germans. Um, so, um, and, and I think the, you know, the, the, the French police were not, were, were not entirely wrong to see an influence of the, the German student movement on, on the French student movement. So there is a kind of delegation from the, from the German SDS uh, in, in, in Paris, uh, and they appear to be quite influential on, on, on some of the tactics of, of, of the uh, French students. Uh, and, and you also find um, occupations taking place um, of embassies, um, so it's, uh, the, the Senegalese embassy, the, the, the Mauritanian embassy, uh, you find um, occupations of um, the International Hall of Residence, the, the uh, Cité Universitaire Internationale, um, in, involving uh, groups from many different countries, um, in, in, including Morocco, in, including, including Portugal. Um, so, so yes, there, there was a sense that Paris had um, become the kind of headquarters of, of international revolution, if you like, at, at a certain at, at, at a certain point. Another thing that uh, came to mind when um, you were talking about I mean, Darren, thank you so much. I mean, you were talking about the Germans and how the Germans and the French were in strict contact, and of course, there is the leader Daniel Convendit who was actually sometimes um, dismissively referred to, oh, but that's just the German Jew, you know, why should he be uh, part of the French uh, political uh, scene? Uh, but that is just symbolic. But I think that this is the time for, maybe we could take that as a moment of reflection and remember how little time, I mean, in historical terms, um, had passed in 68 since the end of the war, of World War II. Uh, it was only, and I, I mean, I really say only, it was only uh, 23, 24 years. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, both in France and in Germany, there is a sort of, clo um, I'm sorry, open, um, the, the book has not been closed about the national past of their countries. Uh, it both, um, and I mean, in a way, the, 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 the Daniel Convendi, I, mean, just, I just don't want to make too much of it because it's just one person, but the fact that a German Jew was part of the, um, of the uprising, I think, cannot be dismissed. Uh, I think that both the French and the German uh, youth, people who were born maybe in, 1940, in the 1940s or people who were born maybe in 1948 who were 20 then, uh, there was a huge open sore uh, that had to be confronted. And um, when people talk about generational conflict or the fact of being or not being part of a certain generation, that belonging is also a sort of political, historical responsibility. And I think that part of 68, um, and I think it's under study, I think that part of 68 deals not only with the colonial past, but also with the past of uh, the Nazi, um, um, the Nazi uh, rise, rise to power and then the botched, um, the botched uh, purification or the botched exclusion of the former Nazi or former collaborators in France from official politics. And maybe more can, I, I don't think that there are enough studies about that, about how 68 was also, you know, 
was also a way to um, to reopen that book, you know, to keep that book open, to say, listen, this is this is not past. This was only twenty five years ago. Twenty five years is nothing in historical terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we we see some some of those connections with you know some of the imagery that you know. Yeah, the Nazi. Well. Yeah. I mean, it's you know because of course it's 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 a provocation. Sure. But on the other hand, you sure. know, you can think about it. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. But I think from a you know, obviously so much of what of, of this time period is about the symbolism and the signs that were used as a way of building, you know, building coalitions and things like that. Chris, is your, could you turn your video on? I'm really struggling. I, I was going to suggest that I respond to this idea of the transnationalism and then try and reboot my computer and you continue the okay. conversation. Does <laughs> okay, that make sense? sure, go ahead. Yeah, okay. sure. So, so I, th I think that, um, the, the transnationalism of 1968 is an essential consideration in making sense of this rather exceptional period. Um, I believe that um, whilst there was a recognition of the transnationalism at the time, I believe that this is something that has become increasingly important um, in studies around 1968. Um, I think this was particularly evident in 2008 when there was a, a surge in studies that tried to make sense of this, um, th these common revolts that happened, not just from a European perspective, but all over the world at the same time. Um, and I think that there's a general consensus now around the idea that we cannot really understand any national, specific national 1968 without taking into consideration the rather exceptional circumstances that, um, the, the, the exceptional international circumstances um, of the time. And I would note that the 50th anniversary that we're about to experience or have already started to experience is also going to be um, characterized by an awful lot of work on the transnational perspectives of 1968, um, which will not just look at what I would describe as the usual suspects, i.e. France, um, but um, look at what I would describe as peripheral 1968s, and in particular, um, and the example that I'm working on is the case of Northern Ireland, which up until now has been largely absent from any transnational collective memory. So we can see that there is a, a move away from um, the, the, the sort of dominant narrative where France is the kind of 68 par excellence, and, and we get a, a, a much more fragmented and peripheral view of 1968, which uncovers the, the, the real um, magnitude of it. Um, before I switch off my computer and start again, I just would like to say that the, the importance of the Second World War is, is, is clear. Um, it's clear not only in France, but also and obviously um, in Germany, in the, in the German 1968, because what we see here is the first real attempt by um, a generation, to use the term that Daniel is not sure of using, the rather slippery term of generation, but we get this idea of a young generation starting to ask questions about what happened during the Second World War that perhaps the previous generation had avoided for some time, and that's a critical critical point in understanding what happens in 1968, is that we do get this new generation born in the aftermath of the of the Second World War, not having to experience the horrors of the Second World War occupation and so on, and actually then being put in a position where they were willing, prepared, and able to ask questions that that the previous generation weren't um, able to ask. That was, that's a fundamentally important part um, of defining that generation um, of revolt. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn my computer off and turn it back on again. Before you do that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Please do that. Sorry, I just wanted to make okay. sure. Okay. I'm sorry about this. It's, so never, yes. it's never done this before, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Well, we will see you again momentarily. Um, while he is doing that, and he'll join back in the conversation, I want to, um, before we sort of turn to kind of politics in 2018 and sort of how we see the uh, these long-term legacies, I want to turn to the audience, both here and remotely. I know we have a very very robust audience, which I'm sure have all sorts of questions. Um, if you've ever anyone a chance to ask a question, um, then we'll return to 2018. <laughs> um, so are there any are there any questions? Anyone anyone in this room or <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, my name is Ben. I'm a grad student in sociology here. Uh, and I'm also teaching a mini course on um, Mason um, 1968. So I'm going to ask a question actually on behalf of uh, one of my students oh, um, who, who is not able to be here. Um, I'm curious about the, the extent to which uh, folks in 1968 in France referenced the French Revolution um, in any way or didn't, uh, and how, um, how that reference point uh, relates to the internationalism. Uh, of the movement uh, in France 68. Um, so it was there a national, in a sense, a nationalist aspect to the revolutionary movements referencing the French Revolution, uh, or if not, why not? Josephine, do you want to Just I have, I would say no, <laughs> because in fact, because it makes you said it yourself, because the French Revolution actually is completely, by 68, the French Revolution sort of enshrined uh, in um, national uh, self-construction. It's a self-identitarian, uh, I would say, na not national, well, I would even say almost nationalist reference. And so I don't think that 1789 was a reference. On the other hand, uh, I would put, so I, I don't think so. My colleagues might disagree. So in my opinion, no, because it was too much inscribed in the internal mythology of the French state, in my opinion. I might be wrong. But I, I would like to throw in another historical reference that at the level of image might be relevant, which is 1848. Because 1848 was actually a workers' revolt, uh, was also something that happened in the streets because the bourgeois state uh, was already really, really strong in France. And so uh, 1848, both at the level of actors in terms of what we would now call the working class and at the level of tactics like streets, barricades, um, might be a more uh, immediately relevant historical reference. But I'm curious actually to know about what other people think, because I'm not sure I'm right about this. This would be my sense. Mm -hmm. Talar, would you like to jump in? Yeah, the, I, yeah, I'm not entirely sure about references to the French Revolution. I think that you were right that um, it had become so appropriated by the existing state of things that it would is not really seen as that radical of a reference. Uh, in people's writings, I don't see it cropping up. Uh, the only oh, times I see explicit references in my research experience is some of the posters, you'll get like Phrygian bonnets. Uh, so you will actually see that. So you will have some imagery from the revolutionary times, um, but explicitly in the writings, not as much as, as I've seen. Um, I, I may be wrong, others may have done more research on this, but that's generally not the primary reference point when people in France are looking to the French national tradition. The other big examples though uh, are the commune. Uh, the commune is like a, a very big one. Um, radicals in 68 are uh, rereading uh, the history of the commune. They see themselves as kind of channeling this. Um, there's also some artifacts from like traditional French history. I mean, the big thing is the barricades. This was largely a symbolic reconstruction. It did play some kind of a tactical military function, but mostly it was a symbolic one. Um, but the other big uh, reference points, I would say, other than the commune, are the 1936 Popular Front strike is, is referenced, um, as a, especially when there's negotiations with the unions over what kind of agreement is going to happen in late May. And then the French resistance, which connects again to the, the conversation about um, uh, uh, Nazis and and uh, World War II. Uh, this is reactivated to show first that um, you know uh, there may be a world of collaborators out there, and second, after '68, when a lot of small groups turn to like more militant combative actions, they do see themselves as like the new partisans. And there is a rhetoric uh, coming out from some groups that like De Gaulle and the regime is turning towards fascism or kind of fascism. And so the memory of, especially there's a lot of repression during and immediately after 68. Demonstrations are banned, groups are dissolved. So there is a kind of reactivation of that memory of resistance. 
So that would be my, my answer to it. I mean, I think more research can be done about French Revolution specifically, but the other big reference points are Commune, the 36, Popular Front, and then the Resistance. Uh, Daniel, do you have uh, anything you'd like to add? And Chris, we're talking, sorry, Chris, to catch you up. We had a question on um, the uh, relation, if, the, if there is any relationship between the revolution um, and sort of the, the symbolism, the tactics, the messages, and N68. So that's sort of what we're, we're talking about. Welcome back. We can see you, by the way. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, that, that, that's okay. Yes. Daniel, do you yes. want to? Um, I, 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 um, I agree with, with Giuseppina and, and, and Salah that um, 1789 was not the predominant reference. Um, there, there are some exceptions. The, um, so, so some of the uh, student radicals were, were known as, as Enragé, which is a reference um, back to the French Revolution. Um, and um, I came across uh, some examples of um, groups that went into shanty towns to find out about the very, the very difficult living conditions of, of, of immigrants uh, and, and others living there, who um, who set up a what they called a cahier de doléances, which uh, which which oh. is a kind of direct reference back to um, a similar exercise um, in in, in uh, the French Revolution. Um, but uh, but more more frequent, um, yes. Uh, so there is that reference to. Uh, the resistance and, and to World War II. Um, on the other hand, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the reasons why um, that CRS SS poster appears rather jarring is that the weak point in that comparison, of course, was that de Gaulle um, you know, was, of course, criticised for many things, but one thing he certainly was not was, was a Nazi. He was the man who had sent to the in 1940. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think for, for many young radicals, they did they did see a kind of new resistance. Uh, you know, if you look at the some of the autobiographical writings of the people um, who uh, who uh, who turned towards kind of far left terrorism later on, um, you know, one of one of them talks about growing up in in uh, in, in Toulouse as a, as a teenager after '68 uh, at a time when the editor of the local paper was the man who had been responsible for rounding up thousands of Jews at, at the Belle Dive in Paris in 1942. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so those memories are reanimated. But there's a, but there's another um, um, kind of memory of revolution which is which is very which is very present, which was the Russian Revolution. Um, so um, it's, it's easy to forget today that many of, of the of the left groups at, at, at the time, um, you know, from, from the Trotskyists to the Maoists and, and others, um, define themselves by different interpretations um, of, uh, of of the Russian revolutionary model, which was still um, which was still at the time seen as a live model to follow, and that's probably you know one one of the differences, as it were, between between then and now. Another thing to add is uh, authoritarian figures were mentioned and absolute, and that's very important for the goal because as you, as Daniel says, it's, you know, he was the first resistant and that cannot be forgotten. Um, on the other hand, we have to think about uh, the 1950s, we have to think about both the European and the international um, arena in terms of this sort of authoritarian, Catholic, uh, paternalistic, sort of repressive figures culturally, if not directly militarily, because we have to think that these are the times of Salazar, these are the times, Francisco Franco is, you know, is full swing, you know, in, in Spain. Um, uh, and also, you also have to think about sort of more, um, this very ambiguous figure that is Perón in Argentina in the 1950s. And that, um, and so the goal, um, I, I, I really don't know whether willingly or, I'm sure actually <laughs> unwillingly. Perón, uh, the goal becomes just another uh, authoritarian guy who sometimes dons a uniform that he could actually wear with honor, you know what I mean? But he just becomes another authoritarian, paternalistic, Catholic, repressive um, 
political uh, figure. It's just, you know, I, I, I'll leave it like that. I, I can't elaborate more on this. Chris, did you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, um, just, just to pick up on the question about the influence of the revolution, then come back to that point about de Gaulle. Um, of course, the revolution, uh, the French Revolution um, was present um, in 1968, um, and that, that's most strikingly obvious in the construction of barricades, which I think I heard someone saying was was nothing more than symbolic, um, and that's largely accepted in, in studies around 1968. In fact, the, some of the barricades were so poorly constructed that they, they hemmed themselves into the streets, so it's not as if they actually put them up for any sort of military reasons. They were largely... Um, symbolic. Um, I would also refer to the importance of the influence of 36 as well and the Le Front Populaire, um, in particular when we consider the importance of um, the strikes, the nature of the strike movement um, and the occupations of the factories. The, the fact that the factories were occupied in, in 68 was not invented in 1968. It was largely picking up on the on this uh, on what had happened um, during the, the Popular Front. Um, but what I do think um, that these things show us is that, going back to the point that I made earlier about the importance of people taking control um, of the street and, and of, of important places and spaces in society, that goes right back to the revolution and is part of a long line um, of traditional revolt by the, the population um, of France and 68 tapped into that, and nowadays young people who go on protest refer back to 1968 to also tap into that long line of revolutionary tradition. Unsuccessfully, it must be said, up until now, um, you consider the latest event that was anything resembling um, 1968 was the Nuit Debout protest movement, um, which was often compared to um, 1968, um, but it never managed to bring about anything on the same scale um, of 1968. So I think we need to think of 68 uh, as, a, as, as one in a long line of protest movements that form part of the characteristics of the way France works. Um, as for the reference to de Gaulle in comparison to some of the more um, problematic authoritarian figures um, of the time, um, I would be careful about, um, about placing him alongside some of the dictators um, of the time, I do take the point that he he represents a, a rather um, a rather militaristic tradition that existed as a hangover um, from the Second World War. But I, I would be hesitant to compare him to some of the sort of dictators um, of the time, and would suggest that he was in fact merely the personification of the of the the archaic rules, regulations and social mores that defined France at that time and against which young people were reeling. Um, he personified that, but um, um, he was he, he remained quite popular in France um, at the time as well, somewhat of a hero. Um, and, and I think we need to be careful. I'm just saying that um, he's a hero. Um, it's, it's at the level, of the spe I mean, in a way, it's, it's the spectacular aspect of the goal became, I think, sort of, um, it's not that I, I, I don't want to, he was not a dictator, it's, it would be completely unfair to him to say, it's just that I think he didn't look particularly good in that context of um, middle-aged men in uniform telling you what to do, you know, it's just... And, and also, I think the strong Catholic uh, background was losing ground in France. Uh, he was part of a, of a generation of uh, moderate. Uh, he was part of a of, of a right wing, that, if I can say, that was the Catholic um, cultural and social. Uh, uh, so, so part of it, or part of a cultural and social vision that was losing ground. Yeah. Um, that's all I have to say about the goal. I, it's, I, you know, God forbid, I criticize his. Um, no, thanks. No. So to, to move on and give some uh, perhaps others a chance to ask, Illinois, can you hear us? Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Is your stealing? <laughs> Are you there? 
I thought I heard the two dates, 68 and 86, put together. Was 86 a year of great uh, protest also? Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, Chris, I, I think you, yeah, I think you mentioned that. So, yeah, yes. Yes, it, it was not not on the same scale as as, as, as 68. It, it 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 has to be said, but there was um, but there was a, a a revival of student protest in in relation um, to uh, an, an an attempt by the uh, Gaullist government at the time to uh, reform uh, the the uh, universities, and there were uh, clashes with the police in which one uh, young man. Um, of, of North African background was killed by the police. So, uh, so it so it was relatively dramatic, even if even if not on the same scale as as um, sixty eight. Um, and um, that that of course you know is not the only um, ex example. You you know you see revivals of protest in, in France quite frequently. Nineteen ninety five, um, two thousand and five, uh, two two thousand and, and six. Um, as, and as, as Chris was, was saying, with, with Muy de Boo in, in 20, 2016. And um, inevitably, 68 um, is often used as a reference point in, uh, in, in many of these, um, but, it's, uh, but it's not always welcomed by participants in those movements. Any other questions from anyone in the room or? Remotely. All right. So I want to. Um, we have we have a bit more time. I want to bring us up to to today. Um, obviously, we could continue uh, all facets of this conversation in, in quite a long time. But I want to make sure that we kind of reflect a bit on these various sort of legacies that we've been talking about in the present day. Um, and so uh, one cannot, of course, talk about European politics uh, in 2018 without thinking about the rise of populism. Um, both in, in France, Italy in the most recent elections, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, the list could, could go on. Um, and I wonder if, 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 if you all could reflect a bit on what you see, if any, of the legacy of 68 in the rise of, of populism. Maybe I'll start because I... I don't. <laughs> In other words, the problem is the result that 68 actually, uh, well, anyway. So the main issue, so I would like to answer no, and I'm going to try and articulate this if possible. Uh, populism, um, first of all, was not born um, in 2018, uh, nor in 68. Populism is a sort of pre-fascist, it's always a pre-fascist uh, uh, social um, discontent. Uh, and uh, populism uh, is a tactic that is often used, you know, at least since World War I. Um, populism uh, was uh, a tactic to sort of appeal to um, to people that have been forgotten by the powers to be, for people who are now who were once in power or who were once um, somebody and now are nobody. Like it's what in Italy was called uh, uomo qualunque. Is the is the every man. Populism is an appeal to the every man, which 68 was certainly not. Um, <coughs> and in, it's, I think, in Italy at least, it's uh, this sort of populist, this every man, this appeal to every man, which is male often, right? Populism appeal to every man, and implicitly it's a man uh, and white. Uh, arguably has been uh, one of the most uh, important tactics of fascist and pre-fascist regimes. Uh, so I would not say that there is anything of 68 in today's politics. Do you think it's a reaction to? I don't think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put 68 in the same <laughs> sentence as today's politics. Okay. But I might be wrong. My colleagues might prove me wrong. But that's that was my feeling, and I said it. I said it. Okay, that that is what I think, and I said it. Uh, who would like to jump? Chris, do you want to yeah, jump in, um, and then so, we'll go around. 
Yeah, so I agree. I agree that I don't see any um, sort of overlap between 1968 and the rise of populism in Europe today. Um, I, I suppose I can see why that question would be asked, and, and the similarity, I suppose, could be that um, people have become increasingly disaffected with the political elite and are searching for answers beyond the, the sort of parliamentary parties that have come to dominate. Um, and therefore, they're looking beyond the, the, the sort of normal institutions and taking protests to the streets. And we see the rise of extremist parties. That's about as far or as close as I can get to a, a comparison with 1968. But I think the fundamental difference between 1968 and the rise of populism that we're experiencing currently um, across the world is that I would read um, the rise of populism or understand the rise of populism, populism as a, an, an inward turn where um, countries are turning in on themselves, protecting what their own. That to me is the complete opposite of what 1968 was all about. I think 1968, both in terms of the ideas, but even in terms of the transnational spread of what happened was all about looking out, looking beyond. Um, so for me, the rise of populism today is the complete an antithesis of what 68 represents. So Lark? Uh, I'm going to say that I, I actually do see a connection, um, but it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a historical causality. I mean, I think you can take the 68 movements and the populist movements and compare them abstractly. Or you can ask, in what ways do the movements of 68 create the conditions that ultimately uh, make possible the populist movements of today? In that sense, my argument would be that the movements of 68, the social movements of the 60s and 70s, contributed to a multi-layered crisis in the 1970s, a social, economic, political crisis that really brought the old way of things down and kind of opened it up. And in the late 70s, uh, I think across the West, uh, not just France, there are different solutions on the table for how to deal with this crisis. In Great Britain, in the United States, the solution very qu quickly becomes neoliberal. In France, it's a kind of revitalized Keynesianism under Mitterrand. But in 83, you get again the adoption of neoliberalism. So I think what we're seeing today is actually the breakdown of the neoliberal solution to the crisis that the movements of 68 had caused. So I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say there's an automatic connection. I think there's an indirect one. But it's very clear that, to me, the 68 movements trigger a crisis. There is an attempt to solve it through neoliberalism. That neoliberal solution is now in full crisis. And there's a collapse of the neoliberal center. And now you have uh, populist movements that have emerged. I'm going to go to Daniel first, and I'll come back to you. Daniel, do you want to? Yeah, yeah yes. Um, I. I... I uh, agree that the, the connection between um, 1968 then and populism today, if we want to use that term, I know there is a lot of debate about, about the use of it. I agree that that connection is not, is not a direct one. It would be anachronistic um, to, to, to place, I think, you know, too direct a causal relationship. But nevertheless, I think there are, there are links um, beneath the surface. So if, if, if we look at um, the extreme right version of, of populism in France today with, with the Front National, um, and, and again, there is a lot of d debate about that, or at least there used to be about what, you know, whether the National Front is a, is, is a uh, populist party or, or, or a fascist party, um, you can trace the origins of the National Front um, back, back to 1972 and um, an initiative taken by a, essentially a group of uh, of student-based uh, extreme right activists uh, to create something that looked more like um, a, a kind of respectable political party uh, with, with, with uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen as, as, the, as the figurehead. Um, but in many ways, the political impetus from that comes from um, the extreme right mobilizations at that time, which are in part a kind of reaction against the, um, the, the, the strength of the extreme left um, in in the in student circles um, then, and you can see 
Um, today, I think a certain kind of discourse about 1968 on the on the extreme right in in France um, that says you know that this this was when this was when the rot set in because this was when um, you know the the uh, taxes of, of, of hardworking ordinary people are, are then uh, abused by uh, by left wing students to to kind of you know rip rip up their their campuses. So uh, so the kind of anti 68 backlash, which you also see then on 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 the mainstream um, right as well, since uh, since Nick Nicolas Sarkozy, um, in part, is a kind of um, discourse about 1968 um, and, and 1968 as, as, the, as, the, as the kind of foundational moment in the, in the decline of, of French culture. Um, now, of course, there's also, um, so some would suggest, um, a left wing version of, of populism uh, in Europe today. Um, which in, in the case of France, uh, you, you, you could see with the 20% uh, of the vote achieved by, by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the radical left candidate in last year's, uh, last year's election. And um, I think it, 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 it isn't a coincidence that um, you know, both uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon or Jeremy Corbyn, who's, who's the kind of equivalent in, in Britain, or, or, you know, or Bernie Sanders in, in, in the US, that all those figures um, are, you know, are now old, older men who um, were first politically active in the years around, around 1968. And so therefore, there is perhaps a kind of nostalgia for, for, for 68 within um, the, the, the kind of enthusiasm shown by, by, by sections of, of uh, youth today um, for those, those, those kinds of, of, of figures who were, you know, until, until recently very, very marginalized. So, so Mélenchon, um, you know, just, just after 1968 was, uh, was, was an organizer of uh, lycée, lycée movements, you know, amongst, amongst uh, school students. So, uh, so even if his, his ideology is in, in many ways rather more traditional left um, than, uh, than, you know, than, than some of the other groups around, around 68, there is a long-term con continuity there, yeah. I think a lot is the definition of populism. I don't think that populism and socialism are synonymous. If you think so, of course, then one can, you know, for me, they're completely different. And so maybe it's the meaning of populism that, um, you know, we are debating and it's a long, uh, it would be too long to explore. Uh, one thing I would like to say with the and then it's also, there is also a larger question about what we consider historical causality, because um, for me, it would be a stretch to say that the movements of 68 uh, were part of the crisis of the 1970s. Uh, the crisis of the 1970s was the crisis of overproduction, uh, the crisis of 1973, which then, uh, uh, you know, it was a crisis of, uh, of overproduction, a crisis of, uh, uh, in a way, one of the first crises of uh, advanced capitalist societies. Uh, so I'm not sure. So I, I do think that maybe, uh, I, I would have a lot to say, but I, I think that maybe the discrepancy in our answers might, uh, might derive from a concept of historical causality by what is populism, what is socialism, and how can a reactionary movement like uh, the foundation of the Front National, which actually uh, was founded by Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was an irreducible officer of the colonial army in Algeria and was part and parcel of the culture that the May 68 movement was against. So then to say that it's the fault of 68 that the fascist reactionaries that founded the party, in 19, the Front National in 1972, you know, that is, a, that is an understanding of historical causality that would need to be also, uh, but we don't have time to be to go into this <laughs> very, very big question. Well, we are, in fact, just a bit about out of time, and I think to cut off such a, a wonderful conversation. Um, I think we can all agree that um, the, the legacy of 68 is perhaps contested. Uh, we had uh, our kickoff keynote uh, of our series this, this, this uh, semester was Todd Gitlin uh, from Columbia University, who gave us a very interesting presentation about what he called the ambiguous legacy of, of, of 1968 and talked all about sort of how con the, the, the contested nature of 
of, of the legacy that I think we're, we're seeing today. Um, I think the one thing we can all agree on, and I think this is something that I think Chris alluded to and Josephina as well, is that perhaps the legacy is the streets, right? Is, right. is the image of the, the poster that I, or the poster that I, that I showed, which is the beauty is in the streets, right? That we still see that when, you know, when, when individuals, wherever they may be, are, are unhappy with the status quo, that they often turn to extra parliamentary politics. And whether that is peaceful or becomes more violent depends on the context and on the, on the situation. So I think that we can all agree that that is something that, um, for good or bad, is is one of one of the legacies of, of, of these events of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, I'd encourage any of you that are more interested in learning more about this. All of our uh, panelists have written, as I said in the intro, some very interesting uh, monographs, articles on various aspects of 68. So I encourage you to. Um, follow up with some of, of their writings. And I want to thank everyone for joining us both here in Pittsburgh and, and remotely and, and hope you uh, enjoyed the conversation today. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.